Good morning. I'd like to welcome Jan Todd here today. To Thanks, Jack. I'm delighted to be here. In your hometown of Austin. And this is part of ACSM's uh, Distinguished Leaders in Exercise Science and Sports Medicine series. And first, Jan, I just wanted to talk a little bit about your early career and, and your education and then <clears throat> from there move into that point in your life when you discovered weights mm -hmm. and maybe discovered Terry <laughs> at, at the same time. It's actually Terry first, <laughs> then weights. <laughs> well, you can straighten this out on the order and sure. then end up uh, perhaps talking a little bit in your experience, you've been in it the whole way through, uh, sort of the strength movement, especially related to women mm -hmm. and the fact that I go to the gym at lunchtime and there's as many women there as there are guys, sure. and many of them are lifting weights, right. free weights, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. And I know, again, from my experience, that that's fairly recent. Relatively recent, yeah. yes. So, uh, so maybe we could just start out a little bit <clears throat> about your, your, your early background. Mm -hmm. And uh, you and I know each other as historians, but before you were into history a lot, you did a lot of other things. So. Right. Um, well... Thanks for letting me be here. I'm honored to be part of this, so thank you for that. Um, okay, well, actually, I, you know, I'm sort of the odd person somehow in the fitness, indus not industry, but in the f study of fitness because, like a lot of women of my generation, when I was going through high school, I actually didn't play sports because we didn't have sports in my high yeah. school. Did a little bit of swimming, went to college, went to a small university called Mercer University in Macon, Georgia for my undergraduate degree, majored in English and philosophy, Got my teaching certificate, but I was going to be an English teacher, history teacher, not, you know, not somebody doing fitness. And that all changed for me in 1973 after Terry and I married. And Terry had been the national champion in men's powerlifting and also in, was the national junior champion in Olympic weightlifting. And he was a regular trainer at that point. He quit competing, but he still went to the gym. Was this at your university? And this was at my university. I mean, of course, he was a sort of legendary figure at the university because he was the one person in 1973 that I knew who lifted weights because even for fitness purposes, it was not uncommon, but it was not anywhere nearly as widely practiced an activity as it is today. Mm -hmm. And so when we married, I started tagging along to the gym, like a dutiful, you know, you want to spend time with your husband because you really like them, you mm -hmm. know, in the early this days. This is what he does. So. <laughs> it's what he does, and let me figure this out. And so I tagged along to the gym, and, uh, and that was actually a little complicated at Mercer because there was one gym for uh, the university students, but it was only for men. And so we had to get special permission for me to train at the men's gym, and then there was another health club in town. This was in Macon, Georgia, of course, mm -hmm. and so we actually, Terry had to get special permission for me to actually train there because, again, I could have gone to Ladies' Day at the European Health Spa in town, <laughs> but to go Is to... Is that once a year? <laughs> well, it was, <laughs> or you know, once a week? Twice a week. <laughs> twice a week. But to go to the gym with my husband, <clears throat> which is really what I wanted to do, that required special permission in 1973. But um, what then happened was, of course, I s met a young lady here in Austin, Texas, came home for Christmas with Terry to see his family. Mm -hmm. She had um, actually competed in a men's powerlifting meet where they needed a small person to fill in the 114-pound weight class. And so she was in the gym training doing heavy deadlifts, and I was fascinated by that because the sort of light stuff that I was doing was okay, but it wasn't really particularly wonderful in my estimation at that mm -hmm. point and I think my sort of competitiveness rose and I thought wow that would be kind of interesting and Terry's research and his doctoral dissertation as you know was about the history of resistance training and and so when we met her and then of course we had some conversations about all this Terry of course knew well you know while there aren't a lot of women around right now who are lifting weights Historically, there were some earlier figures, and so he knew about people like Katie Sandwina and Minerva, the strong, women. the strong women of the circuses and vaudeville. And so <clears throat> he also, we started looking through some of the stuff that he had saved from his dissertation and discovered that there was a uh, one record listed in the Guinness Book of, of, well, there were two records. One I thought was beyond me, but the, the lifting, there was a deadlift record that had been set in 1926. 
And so with really about as much um, sort of seriousness as you would decide to become, you know, the, the person who could eat, you know, the hot do win the hot dog eating contest or something, I thought, well, that would be kind of fun, and it actually would give me a focus to this training. and To try to break this record. Yeah, and I thought, well, maybe I could do this and see if I could get in the Guinness Book of World Records. Mm -hmm. But of course, you've got to remember, there was no, this was 73 when this first, or actually December 73 is when I met her, and so in the year after that, I continued training. There was no organized competitions yet for women's powerlifting or bodybuilding or women's Olympic weightlifting. And so when I finally felt strong enough that we sort of thought I had a chance to break this record, which was about 18 months later, we again had to get permission. Can she come lift? She's going to have to do this in front of judges, and it's a men's contest, and so we needed special permission. And, um, and so I went in May of 1975, broke the record, and that then sort of became a turning point in my life, and uh, a big one, because I broke the record, got the document signed. I knew I was going to be in the Guinness Book of World Records. But when I went home to Macon, there was a little reporter who came out, did a story for the Macon News. And when the newspaper article came out the next day, it was about two-thirds of the front page of the evening newspaper. Wow. Which, and of course, they had asked me, well, what's next? And, you know, and of course, you realize that you're in part the oddity. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, mm -hmm. you know, you're the sort of the human interest sort of curious figure per mm -hmm. story. But it was also interesting because almost immediately I had girls say things to me like, wow, that is so cool. I wish I could do that. And that's, good. that's and, what I wanted to get at. Yeah. Stuff. And so it, um, so it became for me, you know, and having said that, well, you know, because one of the things they asked was, well, what would you like to do next? And, and of course, I really, I mean, I was interesting to me, but there was no sport yet. Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, it would be really great to be the first person to total a thousand pounds, the first woman to total a thousand pounds, which is, of course, squat, bench, deadlift. This together. is power. In, in power lifting, powerlifting, right. Yeah. And so anyway, that became the sort of impetus for my career. And so to cut this all short, you know, then for about 12 years, um, I, while I did some teaching in public school for a while, Terry and I moved to Canada, and we were up there um, after we were in the early years of our marriage, and he was teaching at Dalhousie, and I taught public school for a while. And then we came back to the States where Terry founded the National Strength Research Center. And at that point, I had become sort of a figure, you know, I would have been in Sports Illustrated on the Johnny Carson show and in People magazine and had set other records. And so by that point, um, I um, had corporate sponsors. And so then for several years, that was really what I did. I trained mm -hmm. and I got very strong. And, uh, was you know, Terry your coach? Terry was my coach, yeah, and, uh, and a good coach. Mm -hmm. it, um, I think one of the reasons he was such a good coach, though, was because he came from the academic community and he actually kept up with things like, I mean, I was using periodization training back in the late 70s, which is probably one reason I got as strong as I did well before it was sort of widely known. Because he understood the science of it. Basically. Exactly, yeah, and, uh, and we were... And when we came to Auburn, then Mike Stone was there. Um, the NSCA was just being formed at that time, so the, their journal was coming out, providing more information. And of course, we were early members of that group and tried to sort of... That's National Strength Coaches. National, actually, at that point, it was na known as the National Strength Coaches Association. Now they're known as the National Strength and Conditioning okay. Association. And, um, but there was... I mean, I always felt very blessed that I had both a husband who understood the, um, the gender issues involved in all that, um, as well as somebody who was, you know, I mean, who could be better to coach me than the, yeah. a guy who himself had, you know, done yeah, it, had done it. And, uh, and also then had a sort of very strong academic interest in it all. Before we move on, I wanted to go back to that one point that you had made earlier when at, at, at the point that you, you, you broke this r record or you, mm -hmm. you were in the Guinness Book, then you said you, you basically trained and competed for another 12 years or so. Um, <clears throat> what, what happened in that time frame on a national <clears throat> scene in the, in the sense that, like that one letter you got, uh, were there were there more girls Absolutely. contacting you, and 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 could you comment a little bit about and and it, I assume then 
w women's powerlifting became a sport right. during that time. Yeah, actually, it was, I mean, the late 70s was really a fascinating time for, it was just sort of an explosion of interest in women in strength. Part of that had to do with the passage of Title IX and all of yes. a sudden those weight rooms that had been closed to women, those doors are now open. Yeah. And so across America, there were track and field athletes in particular, but also basketball players, volleyball players, crew rowers, who were suddenly really training with weights, and they had a, you know, the strength and conditioning profession was growing. Mm -hmm. People were paying attention to women's strength, mm -hmm. and so in the and and so in '77, we actually had our first national women's powerlifting meet. We actually then formed an association that was part of what at that point was still the AAU, then became oh. the United States Powerlifting Federation. When, when the AAU sort of dissolved there. And then there was uh, a men's and women's division? Well, it was sort of under one umbrella, but there were, yeah, we had separate competitions and, mm -hmm. and for a while, somewhat separate, um, we had a women's committee, and I was actually women's chairman for about four years and helped write some of those early rules Good. and all okay. of that. Mm -hmm. And then we formed an international women's committee so we could have a women's world championships, and, uh, and I served as an administrator in that as well. So even though I was competing, I was also sort of involved a good bit in the administration of things and, mm -hmm. and had a newsletter that I published for a long time that went out to women uh, and men and things like that to sort of promote women's lifting. But powerlifting officially got underway in 77. Uh, women's bodybuilding began having their first contests and sort of forming as a group in 78. Okay. Olympic lifting was a little bit later. They, they actually, I think, had their first organized meet in the modern era in about 79. I think the first Olympic World Championships for women was 1980. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden there at the end of the decade, there's like three new sports for women, lots yeah. of enthusiasm, and a lot of media attention because it was the new big thing. Oh, yeah. But part of it was also because um, Jack Wilmore's study in 1972, you know, which compared the strength of men and women, and Wilmore came up with this conclusion that, well, in their lower body, women compare pretty well to men. That was a very seminal piece of research that we cited over and over oh, again good. about okay. what's humanly possible was for he women. Was Texas then, Jan? No, or he would have been in Arizona before, at that point. That was yeah. well before then. Yeah. yeah, that was actually pretty early in his career. Yeah, okay. And I think there's been some rethinking of that research now. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be straight up, I don't keep track as much as I right. used to with all the exercise physiology literature. It was easy at one time. It, was it wasn't that much. Extremely but. easy. Um, <laughs> I think that if, in looking at the progress of all this, one of the, the big turning points, um, I retired in the mid-80s because I wanted to come back and get a PhD and I wanted to look at the history of exercise because, and, and its sort of social you know, value because of what it, I had seen it do to me in my yeah. life. Yeah. And then um, in the late 80s, the National Strength and Conditioning Association decided to try and publish a position paper on women because one of the things that was interesting throughout this time was though there were some of us who were, I mean, I, could, I squatted 545 pounds in competition, so some of us were really quite strong, um, but yet there was still this kind of like, should we or shouldn't we, how heavy should we go, what's appropriate, and though there was increased acceptance, there was still um, not a lot of scientific research being done that included women. And when we actually formed a committee to write the position paper in the late 80s, um, one of the big issues was um, what could we really say about women? And it was fascinating that here we were in, because the position paper finally went to print in like 1990 after we worked on it for about three years, and almost everything we were able to say in that position paper was extrapolated from research on men because there were almost no studies on just women. And so the conclusions that we came up with then were, A, let's all, you know, let's, our statement was, you know, that we wanted women to, women athletes to be trained more like male athletes. We wanted exercise scientists to begin including women in their studies. In their studies yeah. and, um, and actually, in my work, I've just done a sort of update on what's been going on in some of that. And in the 1990s, after the position paper came out, there was a huge burst of, of research done, a lot of which included women, women. But most of it, though, had nothing to do with sports training. Yeah. Because that was the, when we began to realize what great impact weight training had on osteoporosis for women. 
and that broader message about the overall health benefits, mm -hmm. the ability of weight training to help fight aging, that became much more mainstream. And there, it's just, I mean, the, the body of literature out there now, part of it coming out of Tufts, part from other places mm -hmm. about osteoporosis, you know, sort of, you know, the fighting of debility, all of this has really changed the, the yeah, waterfront. Yeah, I, I wanted to go back to the late 70s again, uh -huh. and, rela and I thought you were going to talk about it, but you went beyond it a little bit. Come back to the late 70s, yes, there, now there's some new sports for women involving right. weights, but the thing I wondered uh, is the idea of using weights to train for other sports. Mm -hmm and where women were, did they come into that like the men? I mean, when you think of, you know, weight training, it's, it's the late, late 1960s, even for men's football. Right. So were women training with weights for other sports in the late 70s, right after Title IX? Or they were did, start, was that later? Well, I think there was a letter that I got from a track coach down in Florida after I was, I was in Sports Illustrated in 1977. They did this nice feature on me, the pleasure of being the world's strongest woman. Mm -hmm. And I got, I got dozens of letters after that article came out um, from coaches or from young women in some cases who wrote to say, you know, thank you so much for being kind of a <clears throat> somebody that we can, I can, I can show my team yeah. that it's okay to lift weights and, um, and you can still be a sort of you know, feminine is a mm -hmm. complicated word these days, yeah. but you could still be a sort of womanly feminine presence or words to that effect. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the, the great resistance, it's, it's a resistance that I think we still have some of today, was that when we began having strength coaches who wanted to work with women athletes, it wasn't, I mean, in an earlier generation, the concern would have been that weightlifting was bad because it was going to make you muscle bound right. or do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. For women, <clears throat> for women, the great concern was the, uh, the issue of how much muscle they might build. And there was a lot of confusion in the early days about how muscular they would become. Mm -hmm. And the greater concern, of course, was because we began just pretty quickly to see there were some women who chose to use anabolic steroids, especially to prepare for bodybuilding competitions and, you know, East German shot putters and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that became a sort of how do we overcome that kind of negative body image or the perception that that is a negative body image by a lot of young women. So uh, negotiating that question of body image, muscle, um, you know, if a guy gets bigger, stronger, more muscular, society sees that as a yeah, positive. Yeah. When a young woman gains 15 pounds of muscle because she's been on a periodization program for six months and she can now you know, she's got two more inches on her vertical jump and she can hit the volleyball a lot harder, people start saying things like, you know, you're really getting bigger. Is that, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's always been an issue for women. I think in the late 70s, um, Sports Illustrated ran an article. It was kind of a fascinating piece that was called, and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm almost exactly sure this is how it was called. It's about women's bodybuilding, but it was titled, Here She Is, Miss What? question mark. Yeah. And the then take it, on the Miss America. Thing. Yeah. Here she is. Not Miss America, but Miss what? what? Yeah. And, um, and so there's always, I think for women who've wanted to do strength training, this in the, in the beginning was a little bit more complicated negotiation. Mm -hmm. It didn't take long though, when more scholarships were available for women, for them to begin to realize that, well, actually I do need to train. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think that uh, one of the things that we've continued to observe, though, is that there is still, I think, and I suspect Bill Kramer and other people that I've talked to in the strength training community would agree with me, there's still more of this sort of old-fashioned concern that, well, maybe we should train women differently. Uh -huh. and, uh, and really, the scientific literature does not support that. Mm -hmm. Now, As I mean, if they were different anatomically or physically or well, I mean, physiologically. Physi well, physiologically, there are some differences, and we're a little bit different in terms of our hormonal makeup, but mm -hmm. basically muscle's muscle. Right, right. <laughs> right. <And> so, <laughs> this is how you make muscle, right? And <laughs> this is how we make muscle, right. <laughs> so one of the, the other questions, Jan, that I wondered, too, is that, okay, we're ta we, we've talked about the competition in weightlifting for women. We've talked about women now using weights for training mm -hmm. for athletics. You had touched upon 
the value of strength for osteoporosis and things like that. But I see now there's like this other, like I, there's women everywhere sort of doing free weights. Right. C can you comment on maybe what, I, I guess I, don't, I not, can't think of the best way to say, sort of the average woman, right. not the athlete. Well, I think in the, yeah, I can't actually. When I started lifting weights in the 1970s, had I gone to Ladies Day at the European Health Spa, I would not have been really allowed to touch barbells. Oh. I would have been encouraged to use the machines mm -hmm. because machines are safer. Mm -hmm. And the ladies' side at the European Health Spa actually had quite different equipment in it than the men's. And it wasn't just that it was like pink and blue mm -hmm. and the guy's side was black. It was also that they were different machines and okay. much with, with, you know, very light loads in terms of resistance and all that. More cardio emphasis, too, for women? Well, and not actually so much, not so much back then. I mean, okay. it was really more like rollers and I not see. jiggle belts exactly, whatever, the vibrating machines. Mm -hmm. but, but there were some of those still over there. But it was more, you know, like a wand instead of a barbell that you would do stretches with. And Something those, lighter. Very much lighter. And during the era of Nautilus and the great push of the early exercise machines, I mean, there was really a big battle going on in the strength community in the 70s and 80s between various equipment manufacturers, even Cybex in the early days, mm -hmm. about whether, you know, you would get a better workout and a safer workout. And so a lot of commercial gyms, you know, they really didn't encourage people to lift free weights. Sure. And so again and again, you would, you know, write magazine articles, as I sometimes did or Terry did, and we would sort of argue, you know, free weights are better. But we kept having to preach that because the commercial industry was not. They were building they, the other side. Because if you're running a gym, things. you can get a lot more people through on yeah. machines yeah. than you can with three weights. Yeah. And it's not noisy, and, and it's theoretically maybe safer, but it's mm -hmm. certainly not as effective generally mm -hmm. as free weight training is. So I do think that's a big change. I mean, when you come into commercial gyms now, but there's also now a generation of women um, who've gone through the 80s and 90s and, you know, we're on our second generation now of, of weight the, trainers. Yeah, you yeah. know, when I came to Texas, I started teaching at UT in 1985. I was hired as a weight training instructor. I had, a, you know, just an instructor's position in the department. And in that position, um, I had, you know, six or seven weightlifting classes that I taught every semester for the general population of students at UT. And I might have one or two women in my classes wow. in, the, in the early Very 80s. Early, yeah. About three years later, and maybe it has something to do with the fact that now there's a woman teacher, which we mm -hmm. didn't have prior mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. um, population was up a little bit more. We're now, for at least 10 years now, the classes have been at least 50-50 or slightly more women than men. Yeah. Because guys now learn to lift weights in high school. Mm -hmm. And so there's much more... I mean, people are educated in weight training at a much earlier point in their life than we used to be. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I mean, I talked in my sport history class last week about steroids and growth hormones, and we were just sort of talking about fitness programs. Well, how many of you are, you know, you asked the class rhetorically, how many yeah. of you are on a fitness program? Yeah. Every hand goes up except wow. maybe two kids. And uh, how many of you have parents who go to the gym and train? And a third of the kids in that class, which is 25 students, mm -hmm. but third of them raise their hands, their parents go to that's them. A, that's a big sea so it's change. A, it's, a, it's a huge yeah. sea change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. huge. It yeah. yeah. doesn't necessarily mean that they're all doing the right things when they're there. But they're doing something. But they're doing something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, time's running fast here, so a couple more things, at least one thing mm -hmm. I wanted to talk to you about, uh, and that is sort of the drugs. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, the idea is to get stronger. Sure. And lift more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it drives people to do things. And I know now, and by the way, you also coached the men's team, didn't you, at Texas? Yeah. Well, we had a big powerlifting team, and so we had men and women on the team. That's yeah. what I thought. But I, but I coached the national men's team in powerlifting a couple times. So uh, That must have been a unique thing. To when I took the men's team to Calcutta, that was a sort of memorable trip. <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> so... Um, I now, and I don't follow right. this closely, but I know that competition is such that there's basically a, a, a drug group and a non-drug group. Well, and actually it's more, far more, in powerlifting, it's impossible almost to discuss competition or records anymore because there are so many associations. Yeah. And uh, where we used to have one American Federation, um, we then split into the Drug-Free Federation and the 
the group that was, you know, was affiliated with the World, World Organization should have been testing but resisted it. They finally did start doing testing. And so then we had a third group. So we had the really drug-free, the old federation, and then this other group who had written into their rules, there will never be any drug testing in this organization. However, since then, it was sort of like opening Pandora's box because if you can make your own sports federation to, to rules that fit you, your lifestyle, then other people realized they could do that. And so I actually wrote, published a piece a couple, it's in Iron Game history a couple um, years ago. At that point, there were 27 different powerlifting oh, federations sorry. worldwide. And it varies in, in amazing ways. A lot of it had to do with what we're, how we're defining drug-free. Mm -hmm. You know, like, are you lifetime drug-free? Are you one-year drug-free or three years drug-free? And, stopped and right what's people. on your list? So. I think it's really made, it's kind of, it's ruined that sport, I think, in many ways. Although there is now a nice, uh, a very good federation, the USA Powerlifting Federation, that has kind of solidified and pulled a lot of people back together. They have an excellent testing program, and they're now the largest federation in America. So they're, they're a, great, uh, a great group, and if you want to work with students, and that's definitely that the direction. Be the that would be the place to go. The USA. What's it called again? It's called USA Powerlifting. Okay. And they are sort of the continuation of the old drug-free organization. But it's made it very hard because, um, because at, you know, there's a federation now that has people who can bench press over a thousand pounds in it. But they allow all kinds of equipment. And the equipment issue, the technology of lifting has, is also something that definitely affects performance and so they have these super supportive shirts that mean that you can't really know what's humanly being done or what's being done because of this combination of leverages and all that. One thing I thought of, Jan, was the Denny Stone. Yes. Is that how you pronounce the it? The Denny Stone, sure. Could you tell me a little, because I think I could be wrong, I thought you were the first woman to ever lift this. I was, yes. Yeah, um, one of the things because I, I was in the Guinness Book of World Records for about 12 years or so, and, um, and so during that time there were, you know, continued sort of media things. And so Sports Illustrated actually asked uh, me to, we were sort of, we sort of proposed to them it would be great to see if she could lift the Denny Stones, which are, in Scotland they have a tradition of what they call manhood stones. So the manhood stones are, in, in villages there would be the big rock and historically you would sort of as a rite of passage, the young boy would as hopefully soon as you can lift it, lift you're it a to. Man. The, yeah, you're a man. I mean, at least so the legend goes. <laughs> right. um, anyway, uh, Donald Denny was a very famous uh, late 19th century Scottish athlete, wonderful track and field athlete, Highland Games athlete, and also did some wrestling. I mean, he's really one of the early superstars of sport. And there's a pair of stones outside a small tavern that supposedly he lifted and carried a set distance and they therefore were named for him. Mm -hmm. One of them weighs 340 pounds, the other one weighed 430 pounds. So together it's 770 wow. pounds. And so I think that's right. Maybe it's 780, but... Close. Um, <laughs> they were heavy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so Terry yeah. and I and Bill Kazmaier and a photographer went. I trained very specifically to see if I could lift them. Um, and that was really the period of my life when I was probably at my sort of maximum strength because I did very heavy partial lifting in preparation for that. And I actually mm -hmm. in the gym did over 1,200 pounds a couple times, but for very short distances. And so trained specifically to go and lift them and, uh, and did. And you did? Yeah, and Both did. Other, you know, Together. You yeah, I lifted them together. But How do you lift them together? Well, it was awkward because they have rings in them. And oh, so they were, like, they were like hitching... They were outside the tavern where you could hitch your horse, and so sure. somebody had uh -huh. bored a, a spike in, and then there was an iron ring okay. on the top, uh -huh. and so you could use those iron rings as handles. But because they're so big, they're yeah. big stones, I have to, you have to put one in front of you and sort of one behind, so you're sort of lifting so it that way. So did you squat and then try to stand up? Yeah, was it sort but of a back legs thing? Yeah, you, you actually have, it's a squatting down, one hand in front, one behind you. One stone in front, one behind. You had the bigger stone in front, the smaller one behind. And then just off the And then ground. off the ground. Yeah, we weren't putting these over our heads. <laughs> right, or <laughs> throwing them back and no. forth. It wasn't <laughs> like the classic uh, throwing it over my head with one hand right. or bybond stone or whatever was the story.
Well, we're, ju we're just about out of time, and I, I, I guess just in closing, I just wanted to get your perspective, uh, big question, but sort of, you know, where we're at, there's just, there's, there's women out there lifting all the mm -hmm. time now, there's gyms and, and competition and so forth. What, do you see any current, what are, you know, what are the current issues? Or is everything going fine? Uh, are, are more women well, trying to do drugs and get stronger? <clears throat> or? Well, I think it's interesting because now we have really three completely separate sports for women that, as I see it, don't interact very much. I mean, Terry and I go to the Arnold Strongman, I mean, the Arnold Classic, the Arnold Fitness Festival every year, and there'll be women's bodybuilding, women's powerlifting, women's weightlifting there along with all the men's sports. Mm -hmm. um, to me, women's bodybuilding has kind of painted itself into a corner, which is a Terry Todd expression, mm -hmm. uh, because at the professional levels, they've continued to not test. And so when you see the, I mean, it's actually become increasingly smaller in terms of its number of participants. Um, fewer people seem to be interested in it and if you notice muscle magazines whereas back in the mid 80s early 80s the muscle magazines were filled with women who were identified yeah. as bodybuilders yes. yeah. and you almost never see real bodybuilders in those magazines is anymore. It, is it that they're too big? They're too big. Yeah. yeah. They're just it's a sort of aesthetic standard that's just not appealing. Mm. I mean there there's a, there are women now who have far more muscle mass than say Steve Reeves did or some of those early bodybuilders of the pre-steroid era. And who, pattern baldness. Oh, pattern exactly. Baldness. And the sort of masculinization of other kinds of features that you associate with that. Mm -hmm. There are still people who like that, who, who are interested in the sort of the upper limits, you know, yeah, what is, sure. what's possible no mm -hmm. matter what cost. Mm -hmm. um, powerlifting and Olympic weightlifting both seem to me to be fairly healthy sports. Olympic weightlifting is still a much smaller sport in terms of its number of participants because mm -hmm. you really need a specialized gym for but powerlifting has become widespread at the high school level. I mean, oh, here in Texas, we have an enormous high school program. They just had the national championships for the USA powerlifting up in uh, the Midwest, and they had 400 students there. About 200 women competed at the nationals. Wow. And um, so it's been a sport that has adapted well. I told Terry, there's a little town outside Austin called Lockhart, Texas. We have the great barbecue in Lockhart. Mm -hmm. And the other last spring, well, I guess it was last fall, I was there buying gasoline, and I went in to pay my, my gas bill, and they had a calendar on the wall from the high school, sort of thing you see in small towns. You know, picture the football team, mm -hmm. picture the track team. Mm -hmm. Local merchants have mm -hmm. their ads around the edges. You have your full, you know, the school calendar there. And the women's powerlifting team was one of the photographs on the school calendar. So. That's a sea change. Yeah, that's yeah. a major. Yeah, that's a major change. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jan. Oh, you're welcome, Jack. It. Always a pleasure. That was that was excellent. Thanks, Thanks so much. No problem.